Hello, I'm Ron Dimmick, uh, an intellectual property litigation lawyer in the Gowling WLG office in Toronto. It is uh, my pleasure today to have Andrew Waugh, one of the top intellectual property barristers in the United Kingdom, as my guest for the next half hour. He and I will discuss IP litigation and particularly patent litigation. Welcome, Andrew, and thank you for doing this. My pleasure. Uh, you and I met uh, several years ago uh, uh, during the Palmas coronary stent litigation. Uh, you and David Kitchen, now Lord Kitchen of the Supreme Court, won both the trial and the appeal. The trial in front of uh, Sir Nicholas Pumphrey and the appeal in front of uh, Lord Aldous and had the patents declared invalid. Uh, and then a decade later, you came to Canada and testified as an expert witness on UK patent law uh, regarding the corresponding Canadian patents to the Palmas patents in the United Kingdom and uh, won the case on behalf of uh, uh, our common client, uh, Boston Scientific. Uh, and now you're uh, head of chambers at Three New Square, very near uh, Lincoln's Inn Fields. You are one of the editors of uh, Terrell on the Law of Patents, and as we all know, uh, the uh, leading uh, textbook on patent law in the United Kingdom. Um, as I understand it, you have a degree uh, from uh, City University in London in Chemical Studies, where you played rugby at second row, as I understand uh, the game. And when you weren't winning lineouts, uh, you wrote a major paper on pharmaceutical research and, and development. So uh, a, quite a, a varied uh, beginning. Um, you were called to the bar in 1982 and have been doing IP litigation ever since. And in 1998, you became Queen's Counsel and took silk, as they say, no longer a mere stuff. Although um, you've litigated scores of patent cases in your 40 years of practice in diverse subject areas from A, antibodies, to Z, as electronic acid, to garden variety patents, such as patents on garden hoses, you are renowned uh, today for your pharmaceutical and biotechnology patent work in the High Court, Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court. We'll get to some of your cases in a moment, uh, Andrew, uh, in particular the activist case. But first, I have this uh, question for you. Um, Actually, before, what made before you, you crack decide? on, Ron, Ron, before you crack on, I'm, thanks for that generous introduction. <laughs> I'm impressed you know about my playing second row at City University because I, I lost a very large Australian client because we were in a very noisy restaurant after a trial. And he said, did you ever play rugby? And I said, yes, I played for City University. And this Australian in a broad Sydney accent said, oh, you must have played with David Campese then. And I said, well, no, I, I never played with David Campese. Oh, what about Nick Farr Jones? He was captain of the team. He must have been there with Nick Farr Jones. And I said, no, I don't remember Nick Farr Jones at all. And it obviously became very apparent. I had never played rugby for Sydney University which is exactly where most of the Australian rugby team came from. And he thought I was a complete fraud. And you know, I never had a conversation with him after that. So um, the city in Sydney was just too close on that occasion. Yeah, well, uh, we play rugby uh, in a few universities here in Canada, uh, but I must say that uh, uh, we, uh, we, we tend to uh, play other football and uh, well, I hope you don't do it through the winter because what I do recall about the case for Palmas the Sten case in Toronto was that it was either in January or February and was just extraordinarily cold and although you put me in a hotel that was just one block from the courthouse I had a roll along bag which required having my hand out of my pocket for more than 30 seconds which about minus 30 degrees was a very very painful event so I was lucky not to come away with frostbite, but that's my recollection of Toronto being in a very, very cold and windy place. Yeah, well, I have a recollection of your testifying in the court. I'll come to uh, later 
in our conversation. Uh, uh, I'll try not to embarrass you much about it, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, uh, I get this question asked a lot, and I'd like to ask you, uh, Andrew, what made you decide to go into intellectual property law in the 1980s, early 80s, when in fact uh, IP wasn't even an acronym at that time, and uh, patents, trademarks, and copyright were marginal areas of the law? Pure accident. I, it was just an accident of history because I did my first six months pupillage with no guarantee. In fact, I was told I would not get a tenancy. I was Martin Morbick's pupil, who's now doing the Grenville Tower Inquiry. And the pupil before me was Nick Hamlin, who is now Lord Hamlin, who's just taken uh, his seat in the Supreme Court alongside David Kitchen, which dates it. And I never, ever used to go to have lunch in Hall, Middle Temple Hall. But, you know, there was no internet. You know, there was no social media. So, you know, a postcard on a post board was, was really how you got your news. And I went to lunch at Middle Temple Hall. And what had happened was there was a very good set of IP chambers um, at Six Pump Court, as we then were. And there was a postcard saying, second six-month pupil required, science degree required, Six Pump Court. And I still had knew nothing about patents. I knew nothing about IP, but it said science degree required. So I thought, well, I've got nowhere else to go. I'll, I'll, I'll give them a call. And um, I duly did so. And I, I took an interview and I, I actually, the only way I found out about who they were is I asked the senior clerk where I was doing my pupillage, what's, what's this all about, Six Pump Court? And he said, well, they're a very famous set of IP chambers. And I said, well, that, you know, IP, fine, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it, you know. So um, the rest is history, as they say. I, I went and did pupillage with Simon Thorley, and um, yeah, as you say. Way, way, back in the, way back in the 80s, I think, uh, uh, patent lawyers were considered to be geeks and nerds, and now they're fashionable geeks and nerds. Uh, uh, in your well, practice... Uh, there were certainly even fewer of them there then than there are now. I mean, there's any, even now, there are only, what, say 20 silks at the patent bar who are, you know, regular attendees in court, and I don't know what, 40, 50, 60 juniors. It's not a lot for a, a, a bar to... Um, uh -huh. Here in Canada, the bar has has expanded uh, greatly over the last several years. So uh, perhaps it's uh, reaching a, a certain level. But uh, um, over the years, um, uh, litigating patents and trademarks, uh, what have you enjoyed most about the practice? So uh, is it the people? Is it the law? Is it the courts? Uh, what is it that uh, you? It's 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 all it? of the it's all of the above, Ron. But you know, being at the patent bar has got negatives and positives. The negatives are mm -hmm. nobody goes to jail if you fail to defend them successfully. No one loses custody of their children if you fail to represent them properly, and there are no tears generally at the end of the day. You know, at the end of the day, we may be a footnote in some company's accounts at the end of the year, but we don't have the grief that the, fat people, the, the practitioners at the family court or the criminal court have. But more than that, we are confronted every day with intellectual challenges, which, you know, the, 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 the legal framework stays the same pretty much. Mm -hmm. Into that legal framework, every case is different. The technology is different. And that's what's really been uh, a privilege to be at, at the patent bar, is that you get to uh, encounter technology when, you know, it's, it's not quite at the cutting edge because you're always litigating a patent about 10 years after the priority date. But, you know, you still get to meet people, experts, who are the top of their field and where I've been incredibly lucky is to be instructed by large multinational firms for whom I wouldn't say money is no object, but, but they invest very substantially in products that are worth a fortune. You know, take a product like Humira, which peaked in 2018 at $5 billion a year for the world's best-selling drug. Okay, I was on the other side, but uh, my clients wanted a slice of that action, which we may talk about later. But you know, your, your, it fees does, were, your fees were a mere pittance, so what they make oh, every day. A, 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 
indeed, small beer by comparison. But you know, the, the fact that, that the point of this is that they invest to retain the, the, the very best experts. And it's not just that experts will want to appear for innovative companies like Eli Lilly, like Glaxo. You know, genuinely, these companies make a difference to, to people's lives. You know, drugs save lives. And we may come on to talk about COVID vaccines. And, you know, I genuinely do feel that, you know, being a patent practitioner, you are promoting innovation. If people don't get rewarded for their inventions, they're not going to invest in them. It is a fundamental tenet that's existed since the statute of monopolies that you should reward innovation and development. And that's what patents are fundamentally all about. And what that does is it's not just the money, but the reputation of the companies for whom I act does mean that they can attract the best experts, Nobel Prize winners, you know, people at the top of their field who are prepared, you know, that generally be on the scientific board of these companies anyway, but they're prepared to give of their time because genuinely drugs, ethical drugs are a good thing. Well, um, I, I know um, from you know, talking to others and reading your cases that you're best at cross-examining uh, experts in the pharmaceutical field or, or whatever science, scientific field the, the patent uh, is dealing with. But uh, uh, as I understand it, one of your uh, worst moments uh, in trial was not in cross-examining an expert, but was actually leading an expert witness. Tell me about that, uh, Andrew. I'm uh, this is something uh, I, that geniuses to today don't though. understand. Yeah. You know, the criminal barristers have to lead the evidence of the witnesses from a proof of evidence in the way that we used to 20, 30 years ago, where you basically had a piece of paper that had written on what the, ex the, what the witness was going to say or you anticipated mm -hmm. they were going to say. And I was, I think it was my first trial ever. I was being led by Willie Alders and it was between Mars Corporation and Cadbury's Limited. And both, you know, Forrest E. Mars was at the helm of, of, of Mars Corporation and the Cadbury clan were at the head of the Cadbury clan, but they were always litigating and money was, again, no expense in these wars. Hugh Laddie was on the other side for Cadbury, leading David mm -hmm. Kitchen, which rather dates it, but they were a very popular double act. A, a formidable uh, opposition. They certainly were. They certainly were. But I was being led by Willie Alders. It was a trademark case in the days when I used to do trademarks. It was all about the trademark treat. You know, you would think of a treat as being something you, you give to someone as a treat. But somehow Mars had managed to get a registered trademark for treat. And Cadbury's wanted to bring out a chocolate in packs of small chocolates called treat size chocolates. So that was, you know, one in the eye for Mars. So they sued Cadbury's and I, we were instructed by Clifford Turner as they then were. And we could not get anybody to support the notion that Treat was a proper trademark that would be seen as a brand or a secondary trademark is what it's called. But anyway, at the 11th hour, I remember David Perkins, my instructing solicitor, came along with a proof of evidence from a marketing brand expert whose name I've forgotten who was prepared to stand up in court and say that Treat was a secondary trademark. So basically this guy is sworn in and Willie Alders says, oh, you take this, you take this witness. I mean, if it was one of 50 witnesses, I would have forgiven the late Willie Alders, but it wasn't, it was our <laughs> only witness. And um, I, I, I was conscious of the fact that I couldn't lead the witness. So I just said to the witness after being sworn in, you know, how would you perceive the trademark Treat? And he more or less said, well, what do you mean? And he was supposed to say, I would see it as a secondary trademark. So I, I right, fine. I was, you know, <laughs> so Willie Alders turned around to me because I was in the road behind him and said, well, what did he say? And I said, well, he, he didn't say anything really. So ask him again. So I asked him again, how would you perceive the trademark treat? And uh, I didn't get any answer. So I thought, okay, desperation. I'll have to lead him here. I said, would you see it as a secondary trademark? Or words to that effect. And before... Before Hugh, uh, before Hugh Laddie could interject to say, objection, my lord, the guy said, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Willie turned around to me, he said, did he say no? And I said, yes. And Willie said, well, ask him again. <laughs> I asked him again, 
And he said, no. And I don't know what had happened, but what was on my piece of paper did not tally with what the witness was supposed to say. If there was a trap door that could have opened up, your first case as a junior barrister for two multi, you know, against two multi, multi, multinationals fighting against each other. Um, anyway, I was never instructed by the Martians again, as they were called, but um, I, was, I was instructed by Clifford Turner for quite a while, but that's, that's history too. Uh, and uh, I, I guess uh, you didn't have any cross-examination of, uh, of that witness. Uh, oh, terms. well, I mean, that's, that's, that, that was the denouement of the story because I remember Hugh Laddie, and he got his robe and he put it over his over my over his shoulders and he with a great flourish he said to Jack Woodford the judge no cross-examination my lord <laughs> sat down again and Sir Jack Whitford, uh, yeah he was a bit of a crusty old judge but even he managed a very broad smile at this point anyway well you know what uh, it th 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 your story reminds me of the time when I was uh, uh, leading your evidence at the uh, Canadian uh, patent uh, stent trial and uh, when all of a sudden during the course of my asking you questions you decided that your testimony would go better if you gave all your remaining answers without any further question <laughs> from me uh, and you did uh, and your evidence did go in faster and came out better. <laughs> wow that's a there's a terrific book of, it's called Forensic Fables by O. And if anybody's ever seen it, great. If they haven't seen it, they should get a copy. And there's a great fable about the judge, the uh, expert barrister who thought he'd make a good job of giving evidence. And it's all about a tram that runs a lady down on the strand and how he, yeah. he was going to give all this evidence in perfect style. And of course, the whole thing breaks down and the judge derides him as a wholly unreliable witness. It's very funny. But, um. Um, let's turn our attention now to uh, what many uh, patent people consider to be the most important and yet controversial uh, patent decision in the United Kingdom in recent memory. And I'm talking, of course, about activists and Eli Lilly, the landmark decision of the UK Supreme Court uh, three years ago. And I, uh, for those who are interested, no doubt, uh, activists in Lilly, 2017, US or UK SC 48. Uh, we talked about uh, Lord Kitchen, uh, but according to Lord Kitchen, while still in the Court of Appeal, um, to the uh, um, in a case called Icecapes, he wrote that activists uh, introduced a markedly approach to deciding patent infringement and then been applied in the United Kingdom for almost 40 years. Now, you were, you were the counsel, one of the counsel, uh, Andrew, in the Supreme Court uh, for Eli Lilly, the winning side. What is the new approach uh, uh, that uh, is used to decide patent infringement that is so different uh, than what was uh, used before? Well, I mean, in a nutshell, a doctrine of equivalence. But, but more than that, it put right something that Lord Hoffman, as Mr. Justice Hoffman, as he then was in Improver, Remington Improver, I think got wrong. And I would say that because I acted for Remington in that case. This was the depilated case where the claim was for a uh, helical spring and the defendant's was a slitted rubber rod which turned and extracted hair in pretty much identical fashion. Um, mm -hmm. Lord Hoffman, or Mr. Justice Hoffman, as he then was, formulated these three so-called improver questions, which was his analysis or reformulation of Lord Diplock in Katnick. Mm -hmm. And the heresy that really followed from that decision was that it was a question of construction. Everything was a question of construction. And once you decided what the construction was, you could decide whether or not an equivalent fell in or with outside the wording of the claim. Well, if you actually look at the Catholic questions, which for example are, does it have a material effect? Does the infringement have a material effect on the way the invention works? And would that have been obvious to the skilled person? It manifestly isn't a question of construction. It's a question of looking at the way the defendant's device operates. And is it operating in the same way? 
Is it an obviously immaterial variant, to put it another way? And, and one of the big changes as a result of Improver is I, I have the misfortune to edit chapters 9 and 14 of Terrell. And it was very difficult, actually, to separate out um, construction from infringement, not because they weren't separate topics, but they've been locked together like conjoined Siamese twins, where it was rather difficult actually to pull them apart. But now they have a separate existence as a matter of intellectual rigor and approach. What Lord uh, Newberger said in Lillian Activist was absolutely spot on. Um, and in paragraph 55 of his judgment, he lets Lord Hoffman down very lightly because Lord Hoffman, after Improver, went on to reformulate the so-called Amgen approach. Mm -hmm. um, which I, again, I take issue having lost for Amgen. Um, but so having lost Improver, having lost Amgen, winning in Lily and Activist, I think probably was the highlight of my career, not because it necessarily was the result it was, but it put right so many wrongs as far as us are concerned that existed for over 30 years. Um, you know, but I, I, I genuinely, I, I, I I think Lord Newberg got it absolutely right. But I have to say that is not the mainstream view. The judges, so far as I'm aware, and, and, and I think Lord Kitchen may be among them, are very skeptical about the uh, way that Lord Newberg has approached it. I'm not sure why. I mean, I think Lord Justice Arnold is, is almost openly hostile to it. Um, mm -hmm. Or certainly he was at a meeting that was sort of a round table that was held at, at the University of UCL. And... Um, so anyway, you know, but it's going to have to take another case on infringement to go to the Supreme Court, but it is going to stay, I think, because intellectually and analytically, it is correct. Yeah. Well, um, we now have uh, David Kitchen in the uh, UK Supreme Court, so who knows? Uh, but uh, um, some say that uh, we should have seen this coming, uh, especially Lord Newberger became president of the Supreme Court. And in fact, it was uh, Lord Newberger when he was a trial judge uh, and had decided infringement in the Kieran and Amgen case uh, was released by Lord Hoffman on appeal. Uh, did you see it coming, Andrew, when you uh, were there in the, in the Supreme Court or preparing for the Supreme Court? I, I think I should have seen it coming and with hindsight, it, it probably what it, it because in in the Amgen case, you're right. David Newberger, Mr. Justice Newberger, who then was, you know, he decided because the the issue there was whether DNA re, re, replicating in a host cell was in a host cell. It sounds odd because when you think of the early days of genetic engineering, where you introduce genetic engineer genetic material into, for example, an E. coli cell or a Cho cell or some cell, it's obviously an exogenous cell and it can produce this material and you harvest it like brewing in a, in a brewery. Um, you know, you can see what a host cell is, but what, what TKT had done, and David Kitchen was for TKT, um, the TKT had this co concept of homologous recombination whereby they could target the DNA in a, 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 call it a natural cell, but a human cell, um, and produce multiple copies without having to use an endogenous host cell, an exogenous host cell, I should say. So, you know, the concept was exactly the same. And, you know, you, you, it was a host cell, it was host to foreign material, and it was host to multiple copies. The fact it was also a human cell was really neither here nor there. So, frankly, David Newberger, Lord Newberger, got it absolutely right in Amgen. And he was then reversed by Willie Aldous in the Court of Appeal. And that was upheld by Lord Hoffman in, in the TKT Amgen case. And in fact, I've got a picture of my six-year-old son reading David Newberger's judgment because he was never a man of few words. His, he, he did write lengthy judgments. And his, his Amgen judgment was was about an inch and a half thick because there was quite a few issues to deal with. But um, I think actually, you know, people do say, you know, that it was Lord Newberger basically putting right 
him being reversed in in, in Amgen. <laughs> but I, I didn't get a flavour of that, to be honest. I, mm. I think he approached it de novo in Lillian Activist mm. and just decided to come up with the right answer. Well, I suppose it's the, the current law until uh, the UK Supreme Court decides otherwise. So uh, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but uh, um, Lord Newberger sort of uh, reduced the, the question of infringement or, uh, into really two questions. Does it infringe with the ordinary uh, traditional uh, construction? And then, uh, uh, then the second issue that's the variant, and in that case, uh, I think it was pemetrexid potassium, nonetheless, because it varies from the invention in ways which are immaterial. And I think the, the claim element was uh, pemetrexid uh, uh, disulfide. Um, he, he sort of put it into a, into a neat nutshell. So uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, um, I, I, I just most people, when they win such a great case in the Supreme Court, uh, might then decide to easy, but uh, apparently not. Uh, you now, uh, developed a new area of the law based on an old case, perhaps, but uh, called uh, Arrow Declarations. Tell me about that. Uh, oh, sure. Well, yes. I, mean, I, I had the good fortune to be instructed by one of your colleagues, Paul Inman, in the uh, London office of Gowlings, who were uh, acting for Fujifilm and Pal Gilbert were acting for Biogen Samsung joint entity. And as I say, I mentioned Humira, adalimumab, the antibody a little while ago. Uh, you're looking at what, $20 billion of sales and they came up with a, a generic or a biosimilar as they're termed in the biosimilar field. And uh, wanted to be able to market with with legal certainty, clear the way, as it's sometimes called. But Abvi, I wouldn't call them quite a one product company, but they are heavily dependent upon Adalimumab and Humira. And they had literally carpeted the, the floor with divisional patent applications. Now, you know, I don't know whether you have divisionals in Canada or Australia, but, but the problem with them in the European Patent Office is that you can apply for a divisional patent up to the time of the notice of allowance of a parent patent. So if a parent patent has taken 15 years in prosecution, which I think probably was the case with, with Humira, uh, I think there were 19 opponents and it was been under opposition for 11 years. You know, once that letter giving you um, a grant of the parent patent, up to then, you can file as many divisional patent applications on that application, and then you can file divisionals on those divisionals up to the time they're granted. So you can almost keep alive um, a, a uh, patent filing prosecution strategy for decades. And this is what Habvi would do. They'd get patents for various tweaks, various ways of administering adalimumab, various uh, mm -hmm. indications of adalimumab, and certainly uh, no ingenuity was spared in getting dozens and dozens of divisionals. And what Abby would do is once the division was ready for grant, they'd turn around and say, well, actually, there's a typo on page 175. Can you put it back into grant again, please? And then, you know, four yeah. months later, they'd say, well, it's ready for grant now. And they'd say, well, actually, I've spotted the typo on page 370. So they would never actually give consent to some of these applications. And those patents that we did sue, they withdrew straight away because they knew they were on thin ice in the United Kingdom. Yeah. And the great thing about the Arrow Declaration, which Mr. Justice Kitchen, as he then was, had decided in the Merck litigation, was at least arguable at strikeout level. Right. That was Arrow against Merck. Um, he said that these Arrow Declarations are a runner. Now, an Arrow Declaration is basically a declaration that you have a Gillette defense. Yeah, and in Canada, we have a Gillette defense, but our, um, our divisional uh, application process is far different than yours in, in the United Kingdom and Europe. And I don't think the Arrow Declaration would be available or would it be of any use, but uh, uh, we do have the Gillette defense and it's a very, it's very useful in, in the right circumstances. Well, the great thing about a declaration is you've got a Gillette defense is 
you can take the prior art of whatever priority date happens to be to suit you and say, look, I want a declaration that my product or my process mm -hmm. is an Im patentably indistinct from the prior art at the priority date. Right. And what it gives you is almost like a Harry Potter invisibility cloak. It sort of shields you that you can go on forward as a businessman knowing either I don't infringe or whatever rights they throw at me are invalid because I am patentably indistinct. So if I'm patentably indistinct, then so, so is the patent because to catch me, <laughs> it, would, it would have to be equally trivial or it doesn't catch me. So you do get this, this um, very valuable right, which is a protection. Um, it's, 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 it's like getting a declaration of, of a freedom to operate. Uh, yeah, in, in fund, fundament, fundamentally it is. I mean, yeah. it has its limits and the courts, you know, the Avi case, the Fujifilm case was a truly exceptional case where the conduct of the patentee was, was truly egregious. Um, but there, there are, you know, other cases where divisionals are used as a marketing commercial strategy as opposed to a genuine intent to get valid IP rights. Um, but the courts have actually still handled them with a degree of, of scepticism. There's a case between Roche and Pfizer where Mr. Justice Burst refused to grant an arrow declaration because mm -hmm. he found that it was just to help the Belgian court. And he said, that wasn't enough. We're not gonna have forum shopping. We're not gonna get decisions out of the UK court. And what's fundamental about getting an arrow declaration, right, is you plead a useful purpose because our declaratory law says you can have a declaration provided it serves a useful purpose. It's pretty broad uh, and all embracing, but you know, you in the, in, in the Fujifilm case, we were able to say it would assist a settlement. That's a, a useful purpose. It would basically show that everything that Abvi was saying about the value of their patent portfolio in their estate was a load of hogwash. Um, it would actually interrupt European supply lines, uh, even though uh, the, 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 the declaration itself only concerned the UK patents, because it would actually, you know, because it gave that wide Gillette declaration, you know, that's something that European courts or, uh, and European parties would pay attention to. And I think where it were failed in the Pfizer Roche case was the fact that they just circumscribed their useful purpose too narrowly. But I think going forward, it, it will remain a useful tool in the armory of clearing the way. Mm -hmm. well, as I said, uh, uh, it is a pity not in Canada, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I, our time is up. I, I, in more time, it's uh, it's been. A joy, a pleasure to uh, to talk to you again today, uh, Andrew. Not uh, in in a courtroom setting, but uh, in, in an office. And uh, I want you to have continued good luck in the courts. I'm sure you will. And uh, thank you, Andrew, for uh, doing this today. No pleasure. Thank you for your time.